morning and welcome to Worship with Emmanuel Baptist Church in Victoria on this Sunday, April the 25th. It's been feeling more like July with this incredible summer-like weather we've enjoyed this past week and the trees are exploding with leaves and pink blossoms. But just a few weeks ago, we were in the season of Lent and during that somber season, we featured some somber music with a string quartet of music students accompanying Spencer Vandalin as soloist singing excerpts from the Messiah. Here's a short clip of that music to remind you of the style. Notice the black suit, the classical training, the serious music. Notice Judith playing viola in the string quartet and Bob playing the harpsichord. <laughs> And now for something completely different. Since the students have just finished their term at UVic, and many of them are heading home for this summer, we let loose in our last recording session this week and had some fun with a totally different musical style. Judith moved from the viola to electric guitar, Bob from the harpsichord to the piano, and we added Tegan on drums, Connie on guitar, and Matthew on bass. Whether a contemporary style of music as you will hear today, or traditional hymns and string quartets, the message of our worship is the same, a celebration of God's power to overcome darkness and set us free from sin. In Matthew 8, starting at verse 8, we read, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Join us now in worshiping our life-giving God who is always on our side.
Good morning, friends. For our story time today, Pastor Joan asked me to talk to you about bee attitudes. Bee attitudes. Hmm. When she asked me about this, I thought, well, I'm not sure that I know very much about bee attitudes. But she's the boss, so I tried to find out. The good news is that my garden is full of blooming flowers right now, as you can see. And that also means that it's full of bees because bees love flowers. So it's the perfect time of year for me to study the bees and try to find out what are their attitudes. The first thing I noticed was that they are very hard workers. They buzz, buzz, buzz all day long going from flower to flower, collecting nectar to make honey. And in, in order to make one tablespoon of honey, just one tablespoon, they need to visit over 4,000 flowers. Whew. I'd say that bees have an attitude of being very focused and hardworking. The Bible says, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. When I see bees working, I think they're a good example of this. The second thing I notice is that bees are helpful sharers. They distribute pollen amongst the flowers from flower to flower to flower. And as a result, those flowers turn into delicious food for us. Do you like to eat apples, cherries, cucumbers, strawberries, or watermelon? then you can thank God for bees because it's their work that helps these plants grow delicious fruits and vegetables for us. The Bible says that we shouldn't only look after our own needs, but also look after the needs of others. So bees have the right attitude here as well. They help produce food for us while they're also making food for themselves. The last thing I notice about bees is they have an attitude of cooperation. They are good at working together. All the bees in the hive work together to keep the queen bee safe, to keep the hive nice and clean, and to produce honey. The Bible says, two are better off than one because together they can work more effectively. The bees show us how to do this. So after this research, I now know what bee attitudes are. Bees have attitudes of hard work, sharing, and cooperation. They're great role models for us. So what do you think, friends? Do you think that I understood bee attitudes correctly? Do you think that's what Pastor Joan meant? Here's a challenge for you. Watch today's sermon, which is coming up in a little while, and then decide whether you think I was right or not. Ask an adult to help you write me an email, I'll put my address here, telling me if I was right about B attitudes or if I got it all confused. Then I will mail a little something to everyone who sends me an explanation. Tell me about B attitudes and I'll mail you something, a little treat. Okay, agreed? Great. Either way, let's pray and thank God for bees. Dear God, the way you made this world is just so cool. Bees are just a small, tiny little part of it, but you gave them an important job and made it so they could do it very well. Help us to be like bees, God, and to have great attitudes of hard work, sh helpful sharing and cooperation. And dear God, please help all the children watching this to stay healthy and safe and happy until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, don't forget to send me an email, friends, okay? See you next time. Thanks, Rebecca, for the kids' story today. We'd like to read the scripture for this morning from Matthew chapter five, the passage that is often referred to as the Beatitudes. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up and on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Good morning. It's great to be with you again. I must confess that I'm enjoying participating in your worship service, but I'm missing the face-to-face -face contact that would be very much a part of this experience if we were together. I don't know how you're responding. I don't know what you're thinking. I can't read your body language. All of those things uh, are, are things that get lost in this two-dimensional way of communication. For instance, I would love to see your faces when I begin this sermon with a Monty Python, The Life of Brian vignette. Uh, some of you will know that The Life of Brian, the movie, was very controversial within Christian circles. Some felt like it had made fun of Jesus. Others had seen it for what it was, I think, with a satire about how we see things in religion and how we get it so wrong so often. And one of my favorite scenes in that movie is the scene of the Sermon on the Mount. Brian's life seems to converge with Jesus' life at all sorts of different places. And Brian's at the back uh, listening to Jesus, uh, who is preaching the Sermon on the Mount far, far away where all the crowds are. He's having trouble hearing, Brian is, as well as the people that are there with him. And one of the persons says, Hey! speak up. Another one says, what's he saying? Someone says, well, I think he's saying, blessed are the cheesemakers. Well, someone says, what's so great about the cheesemakers? And out of nowhere appears a theologian, a kind of scholar, who begins this kind of learned comment. He says, now you can't take this literally. He's really saying, uh, blessed are those who produce dairy products. This movie is a satire. It's a satire of what we have done with faith. Uh, and this would be a prime example of how we have taken passages and we've explained them away, made them palatable, made them safe, and interpreted so as not to challenge our living. Listen to Jeremiah 6, 10 and 16. This is Jeremiah speaking. He says, To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so that they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is, the good way, and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said... We will not walk in it. Do you hear that? You said, we will not walk in it. And this is why I have always been intrigued by the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular, these Beatitudes. Last week, I mentioned that the missiologist Donald Bosch says that we have used the last 2,000 years trying to explain why the Beatitudes don't apply to us. If we can just make it a nice 
little spiritual journey, me and God, or whatever I think is okay. But surely this religious faith, this Christian faith, cannot interrupt my living, cannot alter it. And that's the challenge today, where people want spirituality that is non-threatening, that doesn't interrupt their lives. But Christianity has always been intrusive news. As Augsburger says, it has always called us to a dissident discipleship. He says the Beatitudes are about a subversive spirituality. You see, these verses at the beginning of Matthew 5 don't just wrap us up in a blanket. They turn us inside out and upside down. That is if we take them seriously. And that's why Jesus kept saying those upside down kind of statements and those inside out kind of words. You want to find life, lose it. You want power, then give it away. You want to be first, then be last. One person put it this way, the Beatitudes are not a strategy for achieving a better society. They are an indication of what life in the kingdom of God might look like. The kingdom of God, the reign of Christ, that reality that Jesus said is close at hand, that is among you, even at this moment, that is what the Beatitudes summon in us. The kingdom of God that Jesus announced as the good news. We have diminished it to our own personal salvation and fail to understand how it turns us inside out. Contrary to what some traditions of Christianity have taught, the way to the kingdom of God is not up and out of this life, but it is down and deeply in, lived into this world. We are to be a taste of what it is like to have God's kingdom alive and living within us. And that's why the Beatitudes are so critical. They are statements of Jesus about what the kingdom is like, about what it would be like to actually live out the kingdom of God, reign of Christ as a people. Matter of fact, E. Stanley Jones called the Beatitudes the manifesto of the kingdom and the call for us all to live in it. I have been the president of a Christian university and seminary. I've been the head of a global mission organization and I've pastored local congregations. And I want to know, and I have asked the question, what difference do these words of Matthew 5 make in our living in a day-to-day? -day. What difference does it make for me to live out the beatitude reign and the rhythm in the workplaces that I find myself? These words that Jeremiah is calling the good way, what do they mean to those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ? The first four Beatitudes, verses 3 to 6, are a journey inward. They are the upside-down kingdom values so opposite to the way of our contemporary co uh, culture. <clears throat> Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know that they need God. But we say, Blessed are the achievers who are self-made people and can say, I did it my way. And Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, those who allow themselves to feel deeply, compassionately for others' pain, not feel deeply, but mourn with them. We say, blessed are those who do not allow themselves to be hurt. If the first beatitude is about the end of the self-made person, this one is the beginning of the lover for others. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. We say, blessed are the powerful. 
meek. The meek are open to others, feeling others' need and pain. They are the ones who are most able to be comforted and the most comforting. One of my dearest friends, Peggy, suffered cancer of the liver. It was one of the most demeaning and one of the most powerful experiences in her life. And she still lived, which was amazing. But she had felt the pain and she had felt the loss and she felt all of the things that she knew other people who were going through cancer were feeling. And as much as she hated it, she drove people to the Cross Cancer Clinic here in Edmonton for a number of years every week. She said to me one time, I hated to walk in those doors because it just brought back all of these old memories. But I knew that it was right. And I knew that these people needed someone who knew and understood. If this is the inner journey of the Beatitudes, Jesus offers us in these inner attitudes an elegant solution to the anxiety and the safe way of living our lives. Instead, he offers us to be secure in Christ, rooted with no need to be fearful. For we are blessed. We are made whole. Our lives are fulfilled in this inner journey. And then he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I must confess to you, I have been a bit of a junkie around American Idol for years. I've stopped watching it recently, but I was going through the channels of the TV the other day and I came upon it again. And I was fascinated. There was a 15-year-old on there and she was talking about uh, wanting to be chosen for the 24. And she said this, this is all that I've ever wanted. I want to be a star, 15 years of age. I want to be a star. As I heard that, I wondered, how sad. I wonder if they realize what they are saying. I mean, every so often, just to feel I was made to do music, that's one thing. But to want to be a star, to want to be seen, how, what a tragedy hungering and thirsting for righteousness is the last of the inner attitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the things that really matter. Richard Rohr calls it a holy longing. Your soul is hungry. Your heart is thirsty. You feel an insatiable longing for something. You are restless as you see others marginalized and in pain, spiritually broken and lost. That is the holy longing of the Beatitudes. The next three attitudes are the call to engage the culture and the world around us. And the last two are the result. You will stand out. You will be out of sync and you will be persecuted. We'll unpack some of this next week. But what's so interesting to me in the Beatitudes is that they end with the salt and light passages. Not just someone longing for personal piousness, no idealistic dreamer or do-gooders, but someone so in tune with God that they long for the kingdom of God, the things that God longs for, desperately working to make it happen. Notice, they shall be satisfied. I play the guitar. <coughs> and sometimes I tune the guitar by using harmonics. It's a way of, as I understand it, of cutting the tune in half and then bringing the other tune in. And when it's out of tune, you hear this, ah, 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 ah. but when it's in tune, the waves come together and it just sings in harmony. 
You see, from the inner life flows engagement. If the inner life doesn't lead to engagement, then it's just a personal piety that makes absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God. If you don't understand why personal piety is not enough, here's the answer. Your discipleship is not simply measured as effective by the number of Bible studies and prayers you enter into. They will really be measured by your willingness to move out into the world, acting on your concerns for mercy, looking for where God is calling you. They will see God being a peacemaker because you will be called the children of God. Shalom indicates completeness, and that's the word that that really needs to be understood when he says being a peacemaker. The Hebrew understanding of shalom indicates completeness and wholeness in every area of life. There is a promise in this passage, as I said. If you live this out, you will be persecuted. It is the inevitable part of the journey. You will be out of sync. These days, it's easier to be on either side of a number of issues, throwing rocks and words at the other side. For instance, recently I was told in a conversation as we were discussing a particular ethical issue facing society today, Gary, he said, you don't want the church to be against history at this time. I sat with him and I thought a long time before I answered. Actually, I said, I think I do. Sometimes as a person of faith, I will be against what appears to be the norm of society or even the rigid other side of religious or societal fundamentalism. I may even pay the price for being out of sync. I admit to you, and I confess, there have been times where the church missed the boat on the critical issues taking place. And I'm saddened about those times in our history. However, what would have been different in our response if the Beatitudes were the foundation of our living? Read them again over these next couple of days. Think about what are their implications? How will they change or how would they change or alter the way I live? He was the youngest mayor in El Salvador, just 30 years of age. He was the mayor of a town called Alegria, up in the highlands of El Salvador, with vast housing and poverty issues. The organization that I was leading at the time, CBM, had partnered with the town in house building in which houses were being built with Canadian volunteers working side by side with Alegria townspeople. This young mayor's name was Moises Funes. I remember our meeting not because they gave me the keys to the city in honor of our partnership, but because, but because of the resolve of the man. You could see it in his eyes. He was so committed to the empowerment of people in his town. He was so committed to justice and his town getting what it needed for the times that they were in. He was so much so that he was willing to take on the criminal insurgents and cartels that had held the town for ransom for years. He was not unaware of his name Moses in English having great significance because he saw himself as wanting to lead people out of the wilderness. He was assassinated the next year stopped by a gang on the highway as he was returning from meetings in the capital, shot numerous times, and left on the side of the road. I wept that day. I wept when I heard the news, and I was numb. I wondered, was his fight for the people of his town for justice really worth it 
that he would lose his life. And then I realized, for him, that was just simply a consequence of wanting to walk the good way. It made all the difference for him to live in the good way. Listen to Jeremiah one more time. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. May God bless you in these coming days as you seek to walk the good way because it makes all of the difference. Amen. I've been asked to lead, to lead us in a pastoral prayer that would move us toward this rhythm and the reign of Christ in our lives. So I ask that you would bow your heads and pray with me. God of grace and God of the good way, we come as a people living in a complex and complicated time. In these times of isolation and even dislocation, we feel a need to once again reconnect with the disruption of a life of faith that is lived subversively and dissidently. We realize that as part of that, that we will need to call you and ask you for courage. For the courage to boldly live out in a world so in need of a better way. To a world and society no longer able to live in harmony, but instead yelling at each other over a great divide. We seek to be those who hunger and thirst for something better. We seek for a humility to admit our shortcomings, but still be able to live differently in values and character that witnesses a better way to live. To a world and society so unaware of our prejudices and unconscious biases, we seek to live as healers and even mourners for others. We ask for insight, both into ourselves about the things that motivate us, but also into understanding others and others understanding themselves. Mold us and work in us in such a way as to make us more fully followers of the good way. Stir us up, make us uncomfortable, and form us into a people more clearly Jesus people. To our neighbors, to our city, to our province, to our nation, and to the global world. Set before us a pathway for the good way and enable us to walk in it. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for your inspirational message and the challenges you bring to us regarding how we live out being Christ's disciples. We look forward to next week's message continuing on this theme. A reminder that we have our annual general meeting on May 2nd at 2 p.m. by Zoom. You will receive the link by email this week. We would also like to remind you that we have three ways for you to give to the ongoing ministries of our church, automatic debit plan, e-transfers, and offering envelopes. We encourage you to give gratefully and cheerfully with the blessings God has given you. 
Also, we are thankful that the vaccinations for COVID-19 are continuing to happen and that by the end of this coming week, all adults 18 and up will be able to register for their vaccine. We encourage you all to participate in this opportunity as it protects you as well as those around you. We want to get to a point where we can once again meet in person and have everyone vaccinated will help to make this happen. The worship team will now close our service with a musical benediction.